how true that is, Lord, that your love reaches higher, deeper, wider than we can even imagine. For your love has no bounds, that you even save us. That is love. Thank you so much. Now we ask that you to speak to us through your word and minister to our hearts tonight and change us and make us more like you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Where we are in our study of Genesis, Genesis, oh, that's a good way to put it. Genesis chapter 4. Adam and Eve have been driven out of the Garden of Eden. An act of mercy by God so they would not live in that sinful state forever. God had prepared them or prepared a plan to save them so that and us so we could be with him throughout eternity he had a better plan which meant that man's body would die but then he would get an eternal body in heaven and I don't know about you but I like that plan especially as I see my body fading away on a daily basis you know more bones crick and crack and crinkle you know you know Waiting for our new chiropractor to get it down so he can <laughs> take care of me here. Yeah, I yeah, guys saw that last week. I could touch my toes. He said he could make me touch my toes without bending my knees. I go, that'll be a miracle. <laughs> now there's going to be consequences from the sin. Adam and Eve, fallen, consequences. But the woman's seed was going to crush the enemy and provide salvation, and that would be Jesus. So, Genesis chapter 4, as life now continues on outside of the Garden of Eden. It says in verse 1, Now the man had relationships with his relations with his wife Eve, and she conceived and gave birth to Cain. And she said, I have gotten a man child with the help of the Lord. Again she gave birth to his brother Abel, and Abel was a keeper of the flocks, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. Abel was one who took care of, Abel was a shepherd, Cain was a farmer, or a gardener, okay? So, it came about, in verse 3, in the course of time, that Cain brought an offering to the Lord of the fruit of of the ground. Abel, on his part, also brought of the first firstlings of his flock and of their fat portions, and the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and for his offering he had no regard, so Cain became very angry, and his countenance fell. Then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry, and why has your countenance fallen? So they both brought an offering to the Lord. Cain brought an offering that was the work of his hands, his pride, and his gardening. He brought, look what I have done. Abel brought the best of his flock and slit its throat and offered it as a blood sacrifice to the Lord. You see, God had told him that it had to be, the sacrifice had to be a blood sacrifice because it was going to be a picture of the blood sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. It had to be the sacrifice of one of your lambs. Now they had been doing this where Cain brought, just brought some vegetables, you know, which, which had to be grown. You know what? But to bring some vegetables in comparison to the slit from the throat of a lamb is pretty easy. Especially, you know, when you've raised your lambs and, you know, you're going to sacrifice them. And the family's all there. That's got to be hard. Much easier just to bring some carrots, you know, or whatever. You know, in Hebrews 11.44, it says, By faith, Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained the testimony that he was righteous. God testified, testified about his gifts and through faith. Though he is dead, he still speaks. So what did, what Abel did, he did by faith. And we know faith comes by hearing. 
in hearing from the Word of Christ, the Word of God, the Word of Christ. That means that God spoke to these boys about what an acceptable sacrifice would be. And they knew what it should be. And Abel, by faith, chose to do what the Lord said. And Cain, for some reason, thought that there was a better plan than killing an animal, shedding blood. Let me bring my fruits, the works of my hands, my efforts. Seemed like it would be a better thing. And when you think about it, yeah, I mean, why not? Why have to kill an animal? Doing his own thing to impress God. That's why his sacrifice, his offering was not accepted. Now, in verse 5 there, verse 5a, it says, But for, for Cain and for his offering, he had no regard. So God did not accept his offering. And this isn't God just being me. It's just the way it needed to be done. God has his ways, and sometimes they're not our ways. God's thoughts are not our thoughts. His are much higher. It's just the way it needed to be to show the picture to be complete, the blood sacrifice. There is no forgiveness of sin without the shedding of blood. It's hard. It's dreadful. Tell Jesus about it, how hard and dreadful it is. When he walked to a cross and shed, shed his blood for your sin and my sin, just the way that it needed to be done. You know, I, through the years, you know, I go, why? Why? And I question that. But you know what? I just believe you, Lord. I just accept that that's the way it had to be. Because that's the way it is. Yeah. But see, that's the point. Sin causes death. It causes sorrow. It causes sickness. God does not cause those things. Sin causes those things. We cannot blame God for the state of the world today. It's sin. Our sin. And God took care of that on the cross by the shedding of His blood. You know, the examples we have of the shedding of blood, we, we see in Genesis, you know, a lamb for a man. When Abraham went to the hill, God will provide himself the lamb. In Exodus, we see a lamb for the family during the Passover with the blood on the, on the doors of the lamb. In Leviticus, it's a lamb for the nation of Israel, the sacrifice slain on Yom Kippur, the day of atonement for the whole nation. Innocent blood of the lamb slain. And in John we see, behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, who sacrificed on the cross to carry his blood sacrifice. That's the way it was to be. Well, the second part of Genesis 4 verse 5 says, so Cain became very angry and his countenance fell. He got mad. His countenance fell. He got depressed. You know, this is the first time that we see depression is mentioned in the Bible. He, he got depressed. His countenance fell. He was bummed out. His face changed from smile to glum and bum. He was not happy. And that's when the Lord said in verse 6 to Cain, Why are you angry and why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will not your countenance be lifted up? And if you do not well, sin is crouching at the door and its desire is for you, but you must master it. You know, we must buffet these bodies. We must make our bodies and get them under control. Down, boy, down. You know, whack, whack. Sin wants to make you a slave. Sin wants to own you. just came, but you and I also. Sin wants us. 
do well and you will be fine. It's your choice, he says. He says that to us. If we don't watch out, sin is like a lion ready to consume us. And it does. And those of you who have fallen and struggled with areas, you know how it just wants to take over in our lives. It makes a slave to us. I remember when I smoked cigarettes, I was a slave to smoking cigarettes. I couldn't stop, man. I wanted to so badly. You know, many there are there are times when we look to medical help for depression. But there are times when we need to look at our lives and of the sin in our lives. Just plain look at it in a spiritual way. Matter of fact, you should go there first spiritually. And see before you go the medical way. Could it could just be sin in your life, and you repent and you turn, and the joy of the Lord fills your heart. The peace of God fills your life. And here he is, Cain, bummed out, and God's trying to draw him back and, and have him turn from it. Take it under control, Cain. Well. In verse 8 and verse 9, it then goes on to say, Cain told Abel his brother. And it came about when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and killed him. Oh. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel your brother? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? <coughs> wow. What did Abel do? And look at Cain. Anger, bitterness, unforgiveness. I really don't care about my brother. I'm my brother's keeper. You hurt me. God, you hurt me. So what I care about my brother. And he killed him. The first murder <laughs> on our planet. Look how many we have today. Two people's anger and resentment and just sin. I mean, what is the world see it for what it is? It's called sin. Jesus said this about murder in Matthew 5, 21 and 22. You have heard that the ancients were told you shall not commit murder, and whoever commits murder shall be liable to the court. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. And whoever says to his brother, you good for nothing, shall be guilty before the Supreme Court. And whoever says, you fool, shall be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell. Wow. You know, what Jesus is saying is, if you are even angry with your brother, you're committing murder in your heart. It's the same thing as committing the act. And that's where it starts, in your heart. And then you act it out in life. And then others suffer for it in big ways. People lose family members, brothers, sisters, aunts, uncles, grandmas, grandpas, children, parents. Because of that. Wow. He kills his brother. Then in verse 10, God speaking says to Cain, What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. Now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you cultivate the ground, it will no longer yield its strength to you, and you will be a vagrant and a wanderer on the earth. Wow, man. His blood is crying out to the Lord. Condemnation. His blood that was spilled crying out condemnation, but the blood of Jesus cries out for us forgiveness. A different blood. We have the blood of man, but the blood of our God. Crying out forgiveness. Say, don't go the way of Cain. You know, the book of Judah talks about men who cause problems in the church. And they're out for themselves. It says they have gone the way of Cain. Anger, bitterness, unforgiveness. That's the way of Cain. Anger, bitterness, unforgiveness. If there is one person 
in the whole world that you have a problem with, deal with it. Take care of it. Let the Lord work it out in your life. Let, you, let the Lord love this person through you and give you forgiveness for that person or whatever needs to be done. Deal with it. You know it only takes one. Only takes one that you are mad at to destroy you. It can literally destroy you. The anger, the bitterness, the unforgiveness. Destroy your life. Forgive. Deal with it. Repent of the hurt and the anger. But but they, they have to pay for what they've done to me. There's something should happen. There needs to be revenge. This should be dealt with. You know what? It has been paid for by the blood of Jesus. That person who has sinned against you, it is paid for by the blood of Jesus. Yeah, it's been dealt with by the blood of Jesus. And here is Cain. He's cast out. And the ground will not produce like it did before. Cain, you're on your own now. And so Cain says in verse 13, he says, said to, to the Lord, My punishment is too great to bear. Behold, you have driven me this day from the face of the ground, and from your face I will be hidden, and I will be a vagrant and a wanderer on the earth, <clears throat> and whoever finds me will kill me. So the Lord said to him, Therefore, whoever kills Cain, vengeance will be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord appointed a sign for Cain, so that no one finding him would slay him. Cain saying, This isn't fair. This is too much for me to bear. I can't handle this. This punishment is too much. You think so, Cain? You killed your brother. You think your punishment is too much? You deserve death. It's God's grace that you're not being taken out. But here's the thing. Cain did not repent. He did not turn. It's all about him, not what he did. I'm mad. I'm not happy. Me, me, me. I'm not looking to you anymore, God. My face will be hidden from you. But God's grace to Cain is he still loves him. And I believe that if he would have repented that the punishment, there would be consequences, but I, I think it would, it would have been different. I don't know what it would have been, but it would have been different. If he would just turn and repent. And you know, if you're here, we're watching this online. You know, you've got anger and resentment and forgiveness. Get rid of it. Deal with it. And repent. And turn to the Lord. And give it to the Lord. So that He can bless you. Because He loves you. He wants to help you. So, verse 16 says, Then Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Cain left the presence of the Lord instead of turning to the Lord. How many times have you done that in your life? Instead of turning to the Lord, you walked away. You walked away from the presence of the Lord. You quit. Maybe you quit reading the Word. Maybe you quit fellowshipping. Maybe you quit going to church. And you walked away from the presence of the Lord instead of turning to Him. That's it. I'm gone. I can't take it anymore. Wow. Don't do that. Turn to the Lord. And God has grace. The king. And he wanders and he sells in Nod. You know, Nod, I don't know. That, that may be China, somewhere in that area. I don't know. And God marked him somehow so the people knew who he was and they knew better than to mess with him. And don't kill him because if you kill him, it's going to be seven times worse for you. So nobody's going to touch him at all. He wanders around. He settles in Nod. And then verse 17 says, Then Cain had relations with his wife, and she conceived and gave birth to Enoch. And he built the city and called the name of the city Enoch after the name of his son. You wonder, well, where did he get his wife? There was only the two of them, right, that we know we see here. Well, you know what? He lived nine years. 
I wonder, you know, during the 900 years is when, when he felt old. I mean, I can't imagine getting old, how we get old now, you know, and, and we're in this place now, getting older and older and older, and 900 years later, you'd, like, you'd be a shriveled up piece of potato or something. <laughs> well, obviously he married his relative, and Adam and had other children, and they, they got married. Mankind had not been down the road of depravity yet, and had not polluted himself. And so that's how they multiplied, they multiplied uh, family members getting married. That was then. Now, so in verse 18 it says, Now to Enoch was born Irad, and Irad became the father of Mahujah, and Mahujah became the father of Methusiel, and Methusiel became the father of Lamech. He's, he's going to go down the line, and, and he dedicates this son, uh, the city to his son, but not to God. There, when he calls it Enoch, right? The name after his son, he calls the city Enoch. But listen to the names of his son, sons that he has here, right? Irad. It means fugitive or wild ass. Bahujuel, Bahujel means blot out God, wipe out God's name. That's what he names his children. Bahushel, they are dead who are of God. And Lamech means poor and lowly. Wow. I mean, he's really sour and resent and resenting God to name his children those names. I mean, that's really that's really really sad to name your kids like that. I mean, how many people today name their kids? Uh, Jude, what's his name? One of the guy who, who Judah, no, no, huh? Jesus. Judas, yeah, I couldn't remember his name. Beep, beep, beep. But Judah, Judah, yeah, a lot of Judas, but Judas, you know, not a lot of people name their kid Judas. I, I mean, it's a good name actually, but you know, there's has something that goes along with it. I wouldn't name my kid any of these names either. Here, I mean, that's not cool at all. Well, his son Lamb, if we look at. Here in verse 19, Lamech took to himself two wives, and named one of them Ada, and the other Zillah. Now, Ada means ornament, and Zillah means shabbiness or temptress, a floozy or undesirable. Uh, that's the name of it. That's what the names of his wives are. And then in verse 20, it says, Ada gave birth to Jab Jabal. He was the father of those who dwell in tents and have livestock. His brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all those Jubal, all those who played the lyre and pipe. As for Zillah, she also gave birth to Tubal Cain, the forger of all implements of bronze and iron, and the sister of Tubal Cain was Naamah. Independent people, these children, businessmen, cattlemen, musicians, in the weapons made out of bronze and iron. So that, that's the people that come from his line and that, that's what they're all about and the things they do. And then in verse 23 it says, Lamech said to his two wives Ada and Zillah, listen to my voice you wives of Lamech, give heed to my speech, for I have killed a man for wounding me and a boy for striking me. Wow. Listen wives, he's boasting. Do you know what? I killed a man out of vengeance. He is arrogant, very prideful man. I killed him. Ha. He looked at me wrong, I killed him. You know, that, that kind of a thing. And you see, his, his family has got the curse of sin in their lives because his dad is not seeking the Lord and the family is not seeking the things of the Lord. Sounds like a lot of people today. Sounds like our world today. And then verse 24, he continues and he says, If Cain is avenged sevenfold, then Lamech seventy-sevenfold. Hey, if you deal with me, you're going to be get it seventy times seven. And this man is prideful. Sounds like a lot of our people in leadership today, doesn't it? Really thinking there's something. 
makes you sick. And then the last two verses here in chapter 4 says, Then Adam had relations with his wife again, and she gave birth to his son, and named him Seth. For she said, God has appointed me another offspring in place of Abel, for Cain killed him. To Seth, to him also a son was born, and he called him Enosh. Then men began to call upon the name of the Lord. So this son Seth, from his line, comes a godly line of those who are calling upon the name of the Lord and seeking out after the Lord. You know, Seth means appointed, and Enosh means to call. So you know what we have here is we have Cain's line, and we have Seth's line. We have Cain's line, which, now listen, honestly, Seth's line, businessmen, musicians, you know, probably actors and actresses and politicians, you know, and, and society today would say, that's a great line of people. But God says it's sad and rotten to the core. Where Seth is our line, calling upon the name of the Lord, called by the name of the Lord, like us, Christians. You know, we aren't, we aren't entrepreneurs, we're not musicians, cattlemen, or soldiers. Those are the things we may do for our livelihood, but that's not who we are. We are Christians. We are the Lord's. You know, a lot of people, when you ask them, we should ask people today, instead of, what do you do? But, who are you? Who are you? But most people today say, what do you do? What do you do? Well, you know, I am a carpenter. I am a musician. I am a pastor. Or, you know, I am an entrepreneur or a soldier. I am. I am a Christian. A born again believer in Jesus Christ. Who went to the cross and shed his blood for my sin so that I can be with him forever. He came back to life and sealed me through eternity by giving me the Holy Spirit to live inside me. God himself living inside me. I'm a Christian. And yes, I am a pastor. That's what I do. But I am a Christian. My wife is a housewife. But she is a Christian first. What your work is not who you are. Remember that. You know, we might do those things for work, but that's not who we are. We are Christians. I am a believer, a follower of Christ. Remember that. So you can be pulled out of our Canaanite cultural world that we live in. Because we live in a Canaanite cultural world. Describing who we are by what we do. And forgetting who we are. Don't. Remember who you are. You are a son, a daughter, of the Most High, of the Creator of all things. You are a friend of God. You are saved. You are an equal heir in Christ Jesus of everything. It is all yours. And God loves you. And He did it for you. And there's nothing you can do to deserve it. And there's nothing you can do to earn it. But just believe in Jesus Christ and the sacrifice on the cross. That's called grace. Can't work your way there. After you get saved, you fall in love with Jesus, and then your work comes out of that because you just love Jesus. You want to bless Him and you want to do things for Him. And you want to see other people know who He is. And you want other people to go to heaven with you. That's what it's all about. Our lives are His. So let's let Him use us. Lord Jesus, even now, Lord, here in this room or watching online, we surrender our hearts, our minds, our lives to You right now. Lord, we are Yours. You paid for us and bought us with a price, Your own life, Your own blood. And You want to fill us with Yourself and to use us in this world. Thank You, Lord. Thank you that you did it all for us. And I pray for those, Lord, who are listening right now or watching, that they would surrender their hearts, their minds, their lives to you right now. Just pray that simple prayer of repentance. Ask forgiveness for the sin that they've been caught up in their lives. 
and knowing that you will forgive them and give them a new life and you will come and live inside them because your blood, Lord, took care of that sin. And they just need to believe it with their whole heart and believe that you came out of that grave in your life today. And Lord, they will be born again. I pray they would pray that prayer even now, Lord. And join us in eternity. Oh, yes, Lord. Thank you so much. Glorify yourself, yourself, through our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, God bless you. We'll be back here on Sunday morning going through the book of Acts. So, be good to see you then. Look forward to you. Amen.